Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Faith for Her. And I am so excited to have a guest today to share with you. Her name is Katie Ferris. Yes, we're going to have two Katies on the podcast today. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, such a great name. Um, and we're going to be talking about how to deal with disappointment in motherhood. And Katie has so much wisdom on this. She actually wrote a book about it called God is Still Good. And so we're going to talk a lot about um, that book today, some things that she shared in it. And I'll definitely put in the show notes how you can get a copy. I've read it once. And as I was going through preparing for this um, interview, I felt like I need to read it again. It's mm -hmm. like so packed with wisdom that you can just go back and, and keep applying. And so thank you, Katie, for writing this book and welcome to the Faith for Her podcast. I'm I would love for you just to share maybe a little bit about yourself so people know who you are. Sure. Thank you so much for having me today, Katie. This is really a joy to spend this time with you and your listeners. Uh, my name is Katie also, and um, we're talking a little bit before coming live. And I live in New Jersey, and you live in California. So we you know, are on different sides of the continent. But um, yeah, so even like setting up a podcast interview like this, you know, we have to think about time zones and all of those things. But um, yeah, I've lived in New Jersey most of my life. I grew up here, went away for school and for work, and then I came back. And my husband and I, um, we have lived here together for most of our married life. And we have five children. And um, our children are ages five to 16. So we have one who's just entering kindergarten, and then we have one who's getting ready to get his driver's license. So, you know, there's yeah. a, I know, <laughs> yes. <laughs> to be honest, I have not yet, he has his permit. I haven't driven in the car with him yet. That's been him and my husband. <laughs> so that day is yet to come, um, but soon, I'm sure. So, yeah, but it's, these are exciting days too, you know, just to, um, you know, for, for each of the children, but just to be in this season. And uh, yeah, and then I'm also an author um, and I'm excited to get to talk to you about my newest book, God is Still Good. Uh, the subtitle is Gospel, Hope, and Comfort for the Unexpected Sorrows of Motherhood. And so, you know, as we talk, part of my story does include some of the sorrows of motherhood as well. So yeah, glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks for being here. And um, just to sort of recap the last teaching episode, um, we were talking about Eve and her motherhood. And so we talk about Eve in the garden quite a bit. Um, and we tell the Cain and Abel story quite a bit, but we don't often connect Eve to her motherhood in that season. And so as I was thinking through teaching that episode, that's something that just really struck me was, um, the disappointment that she must have mm -hmm. felt as a mother. And, and we do see through Eve, you know, her Cain and Abel, she birthed, you know, those children. And we see with Cain, what happens when a family follows the pathway of sin. And we do see God redeem her story in giving her Seth. And then we get to watch what happens with a family that's following a path of righteousness. And so, um, you know, there's a bigger lens to look at all of that, but I really zeroed in on what it must have felt like to be Eve, who had mm -hmm. just been, you know, taken out of the garden um, with her husband, but given this promise that, you know, it, it she would birth or out of her future would birth this the savior and how she must have been thinking when she birthed her, her first son of, oh gosh, this is the one, you know, God mm -hmm. promises, could this be the one? And there's echoes of that throughout scripture, people always wondering, you know, could this be the one? And when her first son, you know, murders her other son, that was a big disappointment for her. And I think sometimes we, we find ourselves in those situations that are so very out of our control and break our hearts as mothers. And how do we deal with those things? How do we deal with the disappointment? How do we believe that God is still good in some of the hardships that we face in our mothering? And so I would love you to share just a little bit of your story, Katie, of mm -hmm. you know, maybe some trials that you have faced. You, you're pretty transparent in your book that you've had some trials in motherhood and how you um, have dealt with those and, and looked for the gospel hope in those situations. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to share some of my story. Um, you know, I 
if I go way back, <laughs> you know, I I think I really did always want to be a mother. And uh, so salt motherhood is a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful calling and something that was desirable. And uh, so that was something that I wanted to be part of my life. Uh, so when I was expecting my first child, um, it was an exciting time. You know, I read a lot of books, websites, um, getting ready for my new baby. Uh, but somehow I neglected to read the parts about a C-section or, you know, some of those kinds of things. And then, so my motherhood experience, you know, I had all these ideas for what um, the delivery would be like. And I don't know that I really thought too far beyond <laughs> that part of, you know, the motherhood experience. Um, I guess I expected it to be painful, but anyway, um, when my first son, his, he was overdue, amniotic fluid was low, he was frank breech. And just from the get-go, like from labor and delivery, that experience looked totally different from what I expected. And uh, he was an emer born via emergency C-section. And then uh, from there, he had significant feeding challenges, but we didn't really understand what was going on. And it was a couple months in before we realized he was tongue-tied and he had a procedure to take care of that. So it was just a rocky start. You know, those visions of motherhood just, you know, sitting, nestling, you know, just I just think of like cuddling my baby in my arms and rocking. Like we had some of those moments, but uh, we also had, I had holding my son, you know, walking the halls in the middle of the night moments where he's crying and I fed him and I don't know what else to do and I can't make him stop crying. And so, uh, yeah, motherhood just looked different from the very start. Uh, but even with that, like I expected some tantrums. I expected there to be, you know, some terrible twos, like those kinds of things. I just thought, oh, that's part of the motherhood package. But then, um, I didn't expect some serious medical diagnoses. And um, when my oldest was seven, I had a newborn at the time, um, my husband and I were confronted with uh, the reality that uh, one, of our, one of our children got very sick and uh, that led to a series of testing. And he was diagnosed with a serious genetic condition because it was genetic our whole family was tested. And through that, we learned that three of our, at that time, four children shared the same genetic condition that um, can impact, can have serious impacts on the liver and or the lungs over time. And, you know, that was a shadow over my motherhood experience. Um, I'm trying to think like all these different <laughs> metaphors like I could compare it to like shadow. It was a wave of grief that rolled into our home. It's all these um these images, but just, you know, just with that came lots of questions about who God was in our story and could I trust him with this? Uh, you know, even that question like, is he still good allowing something like this to happen? Um, you know, we loved him. We were Christians, we were Christ followers, and and yet even even in you know as people who love the Lord, God was still allowing this to happen in our family. So that's part of my story. And then uh, you know, fast forward a few years down the road too. Um, I went through a miscarriage. It was. Um, an unexpected pregnancy. And, and then, uh, you know, just as I was at the point of wrapping my mind around having um, this new life growing inside of me, then we lost the baby. And uh, there was a lot of grief in that time. But, um, you know, life keeps going because I had other children. And uh, it wasn't until several months later that a friend really came. You know, I was sitting with her. I came to her and uh, was telling her, uh, just kind of what was going on in my heart. And she just looked at me, she's like, Katie, I think you still have some more grieving to do. And the Lord used that to really speak to my heart because she was right. Um, 
And it was grieving not just about the miscarriage and the baby that I'd lost, which was significant and there was more grieving to do for that. But I think the loss of that little life inside of me also highlighted for me that, um, you know, with my children's health conditions and these other things that we were walk we are walking through as a family, um, that there's also this like fear inside of me of other premature losses and griefs. And so when my friend said that, I think there was more grieving to do about the miscarriage, but there was, there's also grieving just about even just these other parts of our family story. And so that opened up the door uh, for taking some time to really slow down and look, think on a heart level, what what's going on here and um, really learn more about what it means to acknowledge the pain, acknowledge that part of motherhood and what does it mean to grieve? What does it mean to grieve as a Christian in taking that grief to the Lord rather than letting that be something that comes between me and the Lord, that God actually has a design and purposes to meet us in our grief. So the Lord has definitely done a work. Um, you know, I, grief is still something that, um, it, the word that comes to mind is just pricks. Like it kind of pokes me. I don't live where I'm bawling my eyes out every day or I'm not living in that season where the grief is just constant, but there are things that will come throughout the day that just kind of remind me that we're in the middle of the story or remind me that and it could be as little as like setting up medicines for my child in the morning or, you know, just a decision I have to make about something, but it's just a reminder of like, oh, okay, this is our reality, um, part of our journey. Yeah, I had um, Natasha Smith on the podcast mm. um, last year, and I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she talks a lot about grief and how to deal with grief. And um, she said the same thing, you know, it comes in waves and it's something that you learn to live with, um, but you can also find joy in your life still. And I would just love to hear from you of mm. how have you in your day-to-day -day life, you know, dealing with ongoing grief, where, how do you find the joy and, and how do you find the hope? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do know Tasha. I've enjoyed her as a friend also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talked with her. Um, it's a great question. And I'm just, I want to slow down to think about what you're asking. It really has been a process. And um, you know, even for someone who's reading my book, I talk about acknowledging the pain towards the beginning. And I talk about grief towards the beginning because I realize that there are some women who maybe like that's just where they are. And, you know, there is wonderful like encouragement for them. Um, but I think sometimes we just have to sit in that grief season for a little while before we're ready to move on. And I don't want to rush that process. Uh, so there, ha there definitely was a season where the grief was something I had to work through. Um, and I'm not saying that I've like figured it out or anything, but I think I am in a different place now than I was in the beginning when things were new. I think um, part of what has helped me as a Christian to walk this path is reading scripture. You know, I didn't have a whole lot of time to read scripture in those days following my kid's diagnosis. There were a lot of new appointments to schedule. There were um, just a lot of things on our plate, but I started a list of go-to Bible verses. Maybe a friend gave me a Bible verse or um, there was something that I heard or I read and I wrote them down and uh, I could look at them when I just needed something to sustain me. Uh, and I think another thing that I am learning in our sorrows as moms, a lot of times there are lies that will come at us. And so I think having those scripture verses has helped to maybe anchor me to what is true, what God says, when maybe my feelings say something different. Um, and that is God's word, I would say, uh, has definitely been what has helped me to be able to move forward in my grief and recognizing 
you know, you already talked about Eve a little bit, you know, the story of suffering in motherhood is bigger than just me. And even if I open my Bible, there are many stories of um, moms in scripture who've gone through hard things, who've walked difficult roads. Uh, but there's also in scripture, this theme, as you've already mentioned, that there's a promised one coming, that there is hope. And, uh, you know, scripture tells the story of where we find our hope. It isn't even necessarily in like, the healing of a sick child necessarily like our hope is found in jesus and the hope that we can have um through him in the gospel and so that has made all the difference i don't know where i'd be without god's word <laughs> and um i think it has given me a context like there is suffering but that there's also hope and so that gives me i think a place to be able to live today with hope of it's not always going to be like this. This isn't the end of the story. And I can know the Lord even on this journey. And um, he really is the way that I can, you know, not just be a sorrowful mom, but know that I have an identity that's bigger than that in knowing that I've been loved by my savior. Um, so those kinds of truths for me as a believer have made such a difference. Yeah, that's, that's huge is that perspective of who we are in Christ. Mm -hmm. So you were talking in, in the beginning of that about um, taking the time to actually feel your grief and work through your grief. And you actually wrote in your book, a little bit about godly lament. Mm. And can you share just sort of what is godly lament and, and how do we participate in that? Sure. So in writing the book, you know, I was looking up different dif dictionary definitions of what lament is, just plain old lament, not necessarily godly or biblical. And I was coming up with these definitions to talk about like, it's a wailing, it's a pouring out of grief. It's, uh, so there's like, there's a sound involved in it. There's a physical body and in, like involved in lament. Uh, but then I think difference when we're talking about biblical or godly lament is that we are taking all of those raw emotions, all of those feelings, all of those things. And instead of, you know, going other places or having nowhere to go with them, we are, can bring them to the Lord. Um, in Hebrews, it talks about how we can draw near to the throne of grace and um, find grace in our time of need. And so I love that right in the middle of the story, right in our time of need, we can go to the Lord with all of the feelings <laughs> and be honest with him about what they are, acknowledging the trial, acknowledging maybe a circumstance or a hardship we're walking through and even agreeing with God and, you know, and saying, you know, this really stinks. Um, but also recognizing like, this is because we live in a fallen world. Like, you know, Eve experienced like there is sin in this world. So I think that's where the agreement with God comes in. Like God doesn't, you know, sin was not his design either. So I think it's going and saying, you know, sin has really messed everything up. I don't like this. I think we can honestly voice those words, but then we can also ask him to come in and to do what only he can do that he would come in and redeem our stories, that he would somehow work good out of these situations. Um, and for me, biblical lament, especially in that season after my miscarriage, as I shared, you know, where I was working through grief for my miscarriage, but also for my, the other situations in our family, it was really a blessing to be able to take some extended time. My husband helped me carve out extended time to just go before the Lord, bring my questions, acknowledge even some of the lies that I was being tempted to believe in that time, and just be honest with the Lord about them, but then also to receive his comfort of knowing that he is still uh, who he says he is. And um, I love, there's another verse in Psalm about how we can pour out our heart to the Lord at all times. Um, and 
yeah, I just love the freedom that we have because he's our heavenly father and we're his daughters and that we can come before him and find just our heavenly father is he's a good father that um, we can trust him when we pour out our hearts to him. Um, so maybe coming at it from some different angles, but yeah, yeah. I think that's so helpful. And I think what I found in processing my own grief is slowly as I process it with God, I get the heart of my father. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when bad things happen, it's really easy to blame God. You know, why did you let this happen? This is your fault. You could have stopped this. And um, I think instead, when we partner in the godly grief that you talk about in your book, it's, it's agreeing with him that we don't like this broken world either. Mm -hmm. It wasn't his design Mm -hmm. and it's really painful on us. And so that Mm -hmm. we can partner in that together. And as he changes our hearts, we have that ability to bring a little bit of his kingdom to earth and how we can minister to other people. And you talk about that in your book too, is that that is some of the good that he can bring out of our hardships is being able to minister to others. Um, And so I do want to talk about some of the the good things that can come Mm. out of you know, going through some of the hardships that we face in life and, and what does God do in the formation of our character? Um, mm. You talk about this in your book quite a bit, actually. You have some different ways that God brings good, um, starting on page 100 of your book. And so do you want to talk about maybe just a couple of the ways that God can bring good from the trials that we face? Sure. Yeah. I mean, in the book, the first one that I mentioned is trials deep in our prayer lives. So, you know, we're talking about even going to the Lord, biblical lament, we're talking with the Lord, that's a form of prayer. And uh, that's redirecting, um, maybe not redirecting, it's it's taking all those things and bringing them to the Lord in prayer. Um, I thought that was coming to mind while you were sharing with that too, is, you know, I think we have so many questions. Um, why is God allowing this? But like you said, it's, um, I, I think so much what God wants to do is he wants to reveal himself to us. So I think the question maybe even that we don't even know to ask sometimes is who. So, you know, why, what, when, where, how, but it's who. And I think God wants to show who he is. And as we engage in that process of spending time in prayer with him, it's a way that our trials can work for good in us in deepening our relationship and revealing more of who God is to us and enjoying that relationship with him. Um, a second that I mentioned is trials increase our knowledge of God's character and word, which again, it's getting to know God better in the process of our trials when we turn to him and also his word where he reveals himself in scripture as we, um, turn to scripture and instead of to other things, which there are so many things we could turn to in our trials. But when we turn to the Lord in our trials and we read his word, then we can get to know his heart better, that he is for us, not against us. Uh, And something else good that God can do with our trials, they can equip us to comfort others. Like you mentioned, Uh, again, there's a verse, I'll read it here, 2 Corinthians one four says, uh, God comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. And then it goes on and says, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort. And it's God's design that as we experience his comfort, that we would then go on and share it with others that we encounter who are struggling. Yeah. So, I think for, for me, something that, um, stood out when you were just talking about, you know, deepening our prayer lives and being able to take Mm. things to God, um, sometimes that can feel really hard. Like as much as we're talking about it and sometimes, you know, we can, we can say, oh, read scripture. It's going to make you feel better. But when you're in the depth of your grief, sometimes it's really hard just to open your Bible or even know where to go. Um, do you have insight on you know what you might offer someone who's in that space? Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, I think when I'm in those seasons, I love to go to the book of Psalms um, because they are written as prayers. And so even if I don't have words to pray, I can read those Psalms and I can read them 
and I can put myself in the place of the speaker and I can read those words to the Lord. Uh, and many of them, there are Psalms of lament, even like they're very honest words. So that's a place that I love to go to. Um, I've also, I mean, and there, there's a whole book of lamentations. Um, but yeah, Psalms would be my go-to and another book of the Bible though, that's been really helpful to me in my seasons of sorrow has been the book of Job. Um, it's the story of a man who experiences extreme loss and he doesn't understand why this is happening to him. But as we read the book, it shows us what's happening behind the scenes. And there's this very interesting um, conversation that's happening between the Lord and Satan, where, um, it, you know, it's very interesting. I mean, I don't know that Job ever understood what was happening behind the scenes of his trial, but I think it gives us insight that God was still in control. God was still say, setting the boundaries, setting the limits of the extent to which Job would suffer. And um, I also love the end of the book has been such an encouragement to me as a suffering mom, where kind of Job gets to the other side of pouring out his heart, his thoughts, his questions, and God reveals to him himself to Job in a really powerful way. And Job, at the end, he's basically like, I just put my hand over my mouth. You know, I had heard of you, but now I know who you really are. And like, I'm just going to cover my mouth up because <laughs> he's so in awe of who God is. And that, I think that just, I don't know, that story just speaks so much to my own soul. Like, I don't have to understand everything that's happening. I just need to know the one who does and um, know that. I can trust him. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm in Ecclesiastes right now and it has mm. a very similar message of, you know, life is very unexpected and unpredictable. And, uh, the only thing that stands firm is the Lord and trusting in him. So, yeah, I think those are great suggestions of where to go in the Bible. Great places to start. I love the Psalms too. It's one of the places I go when I just need comfort in my own, my own heart. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering about the person who is tempted to walk away from the Lord when they face suffering, especially in motherhood. I feel like motherhood is this tender space. You know, mm -hmm. when we have this life entrusted to us and our heart just so invested and then something doesn't go as, in, as expected, sometimes it's really hard to, um, want to lament with the Lord. Like we want to take it all on our own and say, you didn't do a good enough job. I'm going to figure this out on my own. I'm going to do this myself. And we sort of close off our hearts. Maybe we still go to church on Sundays, but we close mm -hmm. off this piece of ourselves to the Lord. Um, and I know personally people have walked away when they faced trials. And so what encouragement might you offer to just dig in your heels and trust the Lord in this season Maybe it's a, even a personal, you know, experience of coming out. You said, you, you know, come out a little bit on the other end. And while it's something that we deal with our whole lives, it gives hope when people can see, okay, but mm -hmm. there is, you know, it won't always be this hard. It won't always mm -hmm. be this way. So um, mm -hmm. what you offer in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, my heart goes out to that mom who's in that place, even listening right now. That's a really hard place to be, and it's a very lonely place to be. Um, I mean, there were there were times when I simply couldn't go to church because I was caring for a child, and I felt isolated. Um, but there were also times, whether it was sorrows related to motherhood or other kinds of sorrows in my life, where I wasn't even sure I wanted to go to church, um, and I did because there was a reason that I needed to, or I knew I should, but didn't always want to engage community that way. Um, but I think my main encouragement for that person who is going through that internal heart struggle would be to engage community, um, to find someone 
a fellow believer to share her struggle with, to talk to someone that she knows is not just going to echo what they think she wants to hear, but someone who's going to really listen and um, be willing to, you know, be sympathetic, but also speak truth to that mom. Um, so, I mean, I, don't stop going to church. <laughs> Trust that um, the Lord is going to meet you, maybe even in an unexpected way. Ask him to meet you before you go. Um, whether it's through a song or through a ser- like something in the sermon or another friend who comes up to you, just trust, you know, people have prayed over the service. Um, there are, um, like the pastor has put time into his sermon, like just ask the Lord to use something to minister to your own soul, to remind you that he sees you, that he loves you, that he's good. Um, but I really would encourage going that step further and finding someone to talk to. Um, for me, talking to some of the older, more experienced godly moms in my church has been so comforting, especially surrounding my experience with miscarriage. You know, sometimes miscarriage is something people don't even realize you're expecting, and then you go through this loss. And unless you tell someone, you just walk through it alone. But it made such a difference to be able to share with some other moms in my church to realize other women had gone through this experience or were even walking through it um, themselves. And and then to just have them pray for me, have them encourage me, check in with me at different times during the week. Um, so, yeah, I just wouldn't want that mom to even isolate herself further, but really to take that step of vulnerability. Um, I know it can take discernment to know who that person to talk to is, um, but that would be my hope and desire. And if that mom doesn't have that person, then to be praying for that person. Um, yeah, absolutely. I know my person through a difficult mm. season, she was so good about constantly reminding me how much God loves my children mm. and how he loves them even more than I do. And sometimes that takes the pressure off. I know it took the pressure off of me to say, I don't have to try to muscle through this on my own. I need mm. to trust that God loves my children just as much as I do. And he will care for them because of that. And so she is still very good. You know, if I'm spiraling in the wrong direction in my thought process mm-hmm. to just pull me back on the right path and remind me of that and other things she knows to remind me of. So I agree. Finding that one person and praying for them. I didn't have that person when my child started and God provided her for me. So he does answer mm-hmm. those prayers when we ask him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, there's a section you write about the lies that we believe mm-hmm and how to combat those and such helpful tools. And so I do want to spend a little bit of time on that. And you want to talk us through some of those? Sure. So this is actually written into a chapter of my book, but I also include um, it as an appendix. It's a lie and truth chart. And um, actually my publisher, I'll just put this out there too. My publisher uh, made a beautiful like downloadable PDF of this. So even if a mom doesn't have a copy of the book, she can go to my website, katieferris.com and download a free PDF of this lie and truth chart. Um, so I hope it's helpful to moms, but the way I have it set up, and this has just been become such a helpful practice to me when I find that, um, I'm believing things that aren't true, maybe about God, about myself, about my circumstances, uh, just to really make a list of what those lies are and, uh, and identify them. And then next to them, you know, write down the truths um, that combat those lies. And then, you know, I have a third column where it just identifies a scripture that, uh, is um, maybe supports that truth. So all these truths would come from scripture, but um, just an example I have as a lie, something that we're tempted to believe as moms, my trial and suffering mean God doesn't love me. And it's so easy, I think, uh, for us, you know, to equate our suffering or our sorrow with somehow this 
this is representative of God's heart for me, but it's so very different from God's heart for us. Um, and what the truth is, is that the Bible tells me that nothing can separate me from God's love. God loves me more than I understand, more than I can comprehend. And a go-to scripture that I would line up to support that would be um, Romans 8, 37 to 39 says, No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. And you can put in the place of those words, you know, whatever your trial is, nothing that you're going through will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So that's what scripture says is true. And that's what I want to inform me, um, regardless of what I'm feeling in a given moment. Some other lies that I address and truths um, that line up with them. My trial, this is a lie, my trial reflects my lack of faith. Well, I can read in scripture and learn that actually our trials can prove our faith. They can be used by God to show the genuineness of our faith. A scripture passage that supports that is 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 7. Another trial is, or I mean, another lie is my trial produces only pain. It can feel that way sometimes, but actually the Bible tells us that trials can produce spiritual fruit. Like we already talked about, there's some good things that can come from trials. I share some of those, some scripture passages that talk about that. Another trial, uh, I mean, another lie, sorry, you're doing that, switching it up. Another lie is I'm alone in my trial. And that's just the opposite. You know, the Bible tells us that God is with us, that the Lord is with us. And um, so I have some verses that talk about that. Uh, so, I mean, another one, my trial will never end. It's a lie, whether in this life or the next, the Bible tells us that our trial will end someday. And I love this verse from 1 Peter 5.10. And after you've suffered a little while, this is little, <laughs> speaking time in God's, God's economy, God's sense of timing. Um, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So there are more. But yeah, that's a sample of my line truth chart. Thank you for sharing some of those. And I'll link that in my show notes because we oh, were talking thanks. about where might we turn in scripture when we're not sure where to turn. And those are some really great places to turn to. So yeah, I'll definitely link that in the show notes as well as where to buy God is Still Good. Um, do you want to share about other books that you've written? I think the audience would probably love to hear. Oh, thank you for that invitation. I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, so writing, let me think here. Writing for me is something I've always loved doing, but I didn't know if I'd ever actually write a book. But I remember, so this is, you know, prior to my kid's diagnosis, um, I had two boys and I was preparing at, for my third, was on the way. And I just remember telling my husband in that season, if I were ever to write a book, I'd write a book called Loving My Children, because that's what... I'm realizing I want to grow in because I, there's like this natural love in being that comes with motherhood. But I think I was just realizing, huh, there's also a supernatural love, the way God loves us that doesn't come naturally to me. And I want to learn more about God's love for me and how to apply that in loving my children. And so that started me on a journey of studying and putting together some some notes and the Lord was very gracious. Like I just had all these ideas and was able to write them up before I even um, had my third little boy. Um, so in that season of pregnancy, and then our church used that for a mom's class a, a few times. And it was really neat to talk about that in community. And then um, my husband helped me self-publish that just to make it available to a broader audience. So that book is Loving My Children, Embracing Biblical Motherhood. And then um, there's a season where I really felt like the Lord was um, calling me to a pause 
again, with circumstances in our family, with things that we were working through, it wasn't a time to write. And then this is probably another story for another time. Um, there was a, it was, the Lord used some things in a pretty, like, for me, it felt dramatic <laughs> way to kind of tell me it was the time to start writing again. And, um, and so I did start doing that. And that was the season after my miscarriage. And um, the Lord just through prayer, through the prompting of friends and some different things, just really opened some doors for me to write more. So I actually, when it came down to it, I was like, all right, I think I want to write another book, but I don't, I have so much stored up inside of me. I don't know how to fit all of this into one book. And so I just, on a whiteboard, I started writing down all these different things that the Lord had been teaching me. And I literally just made two columns. And I'm like, I think all of this goes in one book and then all this goes in another book. And I wrote proposals for both of them, sent them to two different publishers. And then this year, both books um, were published separately. So um, God is Still Good is the one that just recently came out, but it has a twin book, which is called He Will Be Enough, How God Takes Us by the Hand Through Our Hardest Days. And so while God is Still Good is written more as um, kind of a guide book, maybe to kind of help a mom who's walking from like maybe just what is maybe she's encountering a sorrow or she's had a sorrow for a while. Like, how do I move towards the Lord and my sorrow? This is God is so good is that book, but the sister book, the twin book is um, written as a journaling devotional. And so each chapter is a truth about God and has a scripture that I unpack. And um, those are all like truths that really anchored me during those harder seasons. And that's written for moms, but it's also really written for anyone who's walking through a trial. So thanks for asking that question. I really appreciate it. Yes. Well, I yeah. have to go back and get the journal because I don't have the journal and that sounds amazing. <laughs> and um, for my listeners, Katie is, if you haven't read any of her work, she is amazing at unpacking scripture in a way that makes it really understandable and accessible. Mm -hmm. So um, I would encourage you to get anything that she's written. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that gift with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I always like to close with asking people what they're reading. So what yes. are you reading? Yeah, I'm happy to share. So um it's a great question. So I recently finished a book that I do highly recommend, um, Aging with Grace. And it was written, let me check here, uh, Sharon Betters and Susan Hunt co-authored it. And I love, like we already talked about having a woman who's gone before us and can kind of give us um, oh, just encouragement and truth about the Lord to help us in whatever season we're navigating. And so Aging with Grace was a really helpful book to me as I think about the next season of my life and wanting to live it for the Lord and wanting to live it well. Um, but what I am currently reading, uh, I have two daughters, they're five and nine, and they share a bedroom and they love each other very much, but they love each other like sisters. And there's quite a bit of sibling rivalry going on these days. So we decided together, we're going to read Little Women. Um, oh. And I have thoroughly enjoyed reading that. And if you, you're familiar with the book, I mean, it's four sisters and um, their life together, which they love each other dearly, but they're also, they're, um, you know, just different things that they're working through together and, um, you know, the ways that they're growing. And I've also really appreciated reading the book because I read it when I was younger. I'm appreciating reading it. Uh, and I just find myself thinking a lot about their mother and um, Marmy is her name in the story. And so just reading the story through Marmy's eyes, what it was like raising those daughters. And so there's another book that I found um, by someone named Sarah Miller that's called Marmy. And it tells the story of little women through Marmy's eyes. So really? as I'm reading Little Women with the Girls, I'm reading Marmy on my own. <laughs> so oh, I have to read that. Yeah, it was like so kind and like so yes. gentle. Just had a way about her. There are so many ways I want to be like her. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, I'm looking that up when we get off here. <laughs> That's awesome. 
<laughs> well, Katie, thank you for joining me today. This was really fun. We'll definitely have to have you back. Are you writing another uh -huh. book? Is there one in the plans? Um, I have ideas, but nothing okay. that's, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll just say that. Thanks. That sounds good. Yeah, we'll pray. We'll pray for that. We'll pray that you're going to write us another book. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, thank you again for coming today. It's been a joy to have you on the show. It's been a joy to talk with you. Thank you so much.